look at the uh, Twitter search um, application in Deedle. I kind of remember that there were some issues with this. We'll see. And we'll maybe try to address them, or at the very least talk about why they happen. start off by running it and then we'll analyze see what it does. It's the emulator. One thing we try to do with each of these is spend a little bit of time looking at the stuff that we have seen before. Just to review. Make sure Everything's clear. Then we look at the new stuff that this example is going to be teaching us. All right? So the way this works is like this. You have a query of, you can write a query to query Twitter with. All right? So we can pick something query Twitter with. So Cleveland Browns. We'll do that today because they won yesterday. If they didn't win, we'll, we'll pick something else. Then you can give a tag to the query. The tag is just a little way up for us to remember what the full query is. So it's kind of like a code for the query and then the full description of it. So we'll do CB. Notice a couple things. This is something brand new. I type in CB, I get the little icon to save it. Prior to that, I don't get the icon because I haven't entered everything yet. Let's flip it around. Let me put in the tag first. I don't get the icon. But if I type in the search, I get the icon. So I get the icon when it's ready to save. In other words, when it passes the validation rules. And validation rules is it has to have something in the query and the tag. I click save, and it saves it. All right? So what else could I search for? Pittsburgh Steelers. I got a question. Yeah. Um, so tags on Twitter generally have the pound sign? This is a different kind of tag. This, this doesn't mean that. Okay. This isn't a hashtag. This is just, it's like, a, it's like an ID for your query. Okay. They're, they're calling it a tag, but it's really like an ID. I'm not even a sports fan, so I don't know why, but something easy. And I was going to say not controversial, but I don't know. That might, that might not be true. <laughs> depending, <laughs> depending on the crowd they have in class, this could be more controversial than talking about a lot of other things. But anyhow, we won't go there. I'll save it. And if you notice here, whoops, then we have a scrolling view that has uh, CB and PS in it. So let's look and analyze a few things that are different. Let's let, well, let's do one more thing before we're ready to before we're ready to discuss this. Let me close the emulator. All right, so I close the emulator, and let me 
open up the em emulator again. This is something that we have not experienced before. Persistent memory. In other words, it remembers it after we have exited the emulator. So that's a new thing. So, what are some of the things that are new in this? If we click on this, if we double click on this, oops, ah, I forgot the gestures in this one. Notice, a click asks us to want to open up with Chrome or a web browser. A long click asks if we want to share this, edit it, or delete it. So if I click edit, it brings it back up, and I can change it. So like if I spelled Cleveland Browns wrong, I could spell it correct. A feature of this is if I change the tag, it doesn't delete the old one it simply writes it out there with a the new tag as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so if I did want to change the tag, I'd have to change the tag. I then have two out there, then I'd have to go delete the one I want to get rid of. And I can long press and delete it. If I long press and click share, and ask me what I want to do with it. Do I want to send a Gmail? Do I want to text message someone? Do I want to copy to clipboard or whatever? Okay, so there's a few different pieces of functionality here that weren't in the other ones. All right. The persistent memory, remembering it even after we've exited the device. A save button that it only appears when we have entered in both of the parameters. The ability to click on the item, long click on it, and get another menu, which says share, edit, or delete. Finally, and this, this might, I have to see if this works or not, I don't remember. If I click on, short click on it once, it will ask me if I want to open up the Twitter search in Chrome, or in a web view browser. Let's click Chrome. And let's say always. Did, did you put those choices in? No. We'll talk about how those choices appeared in a minute. Oh, and there we go. There is the, there's a search for Cleveland Browns on Twitter. I guess it does work. Um, I, I remember having problems with this, and you know, I don't, I don't know when that was. Maybe whatever it was, um, I'm not having them today. Okay. So we'll talk about why those two choices came up. Okay. So let's go and look at this, and we'll do what we've done before. We will look at the pieces of this. Our focus, again, is going to be on the Java bit of it. All right. But we'll spend a minute looking at the resources as well. Drawable, what do you think that is? That is the save button. Let's look at this, though, because it's not a typical image tag. All right, our typical image file is an XML file. That might seem a little bit weird, right? What are images? Images are usually JPEGs or PNGs or on occasion GIF files and so on. This is an XML file. If I double click on it, I see this. What is this? Where it's storing the data. Where it's drawing out the, the colors that you specified. Exactly. This is the instructions to draw that little save button. All right. With the associated colors and other stuff. So, for example, let's go. 
and look at this. All right, the save button, it shows up here. All right. The instructions to draw that are contained in the, this instructions. This is what's known as a vector graphic. What's the difference between a vector graphic and a raster graphic? I said raster, not rasta. So don't tell me about Bob Marley or, or, or reggae music or anything like that. What's the difference between a vector graphic and a raster graphic? All right. Most of the typical image files that you deal with are raster graphics. They're also sometimes called bitmaps. And I know there's an there's a image type called BMP. And that's a little confusing because JPEGs are bitmaps. All right? GIFs are bitmaps. PNGs are bitmaps. Bitmaps in the sense that they're raster graphics. BMP is a particular kind of bitmap. All right, uh, but not all BM, not all bitmap images are BMP, but they're all raster graphics or bitmaps. I know that I, I even know what the definition of it is, and, and what I just said confused me. So let's talk about a ras raster graphic. A raster graphic is where encoded. Let's make it real easy, and let's assume we have a black and white graphic. So no colors. So let's say that all it is is black and white. Let's say we had a circle uh, in this, in this black and white. We have a black circle on a white background. We have the pixels of it. And if we look real closely at these pixels, the circle might look something like this. Where's a collection of bits. But you know, the pixels on your screen are so close together that it looks like a circle, right? What happens if we go in and expand this? It begins to get distorted. It gets distorted and it gets jagged, sort of. So if I went and, and I brought this up in an image editor and I made it 10 times bigger, it would look something like this. It wouldn't look like a clean circle. It would look like steps. It would look jagged, jagged edges. All right? The reason for that is a bitmap literally is that. It contains and it follows different mechanisms for storing this, different compression algorithms. But a bitmap essentially says the value of each pixel in the image. So, there's compression done, so we don't necessarily store a value for each pixel, but essentially we do, we have enough information to know the value for each pixel. So if I make it twice as big, or four times as big, now there's a lot more pixels to deal with that weren't there in the original one. So what do image editing software, what does image editing software do? It makes up values for that. Except it's not going to do a perfect job at this, and you're going to get a very jagged edge on that. What is vector graphics then? Vector graphics is where you don't have the number of bits and, and a description of the bits, individual bits. Instead, you have a little set of instructions, a little program to draw a circle. If you make it bigger then, if you say, well, I don't want the circle to be that big, I want it to be that big, instead of like duplicating this with extra pixels, it simply draws a bigger circle. All right? So vector stores instructions on how to draw the image. A bitmap or raster image actually stores the values for each bit. So vectors are more easily made bigger. 
right? Because vectors, you just expand the instructions. Instead of making a circle with a two, or with a, with a 20 pixel radius, you make one with a 40 character, or a 40 pixel radius. And you just have a bigger circle. And it still has the same smoothness, the same resolution. Let me real quick see if I could find a website that explains this a little more thoroughly. I don't want to spend hours on this, but I think it is important to understand this and understand Here's a good example. Here's a picture of a flower. If we zoom in on that flower and make it bigger, that's what the flower looks like because all we have is the values for each given bit. So we're going to distort it. Or like this, the jagged edges. If we were to make a small VS bigger, we'd get the jagged edges if it was a raster or bitmap image would get the smooth VS if it was a vector image. Yes? So is there any point to use the Oh yeah, you can't do, like for example, photographs are going to be, are going to be raster images. Alright, so something like if you have a photograph, you can't, you know, you want to go outside and take a picture of a tree. Alright, that picture of a tree is like a million different colors, right? I mean, if you look real closely and you brought it up in an editor, what looks like a color green, there's, you know, sections leave a little darker green, some are a little lighter, and so on and so on. There's no way you could write vector instructions to duplicate that, all right? What, uh, what vectors are good for are things like logos, all right? Something where it's simple, not a lot of colors, simple icon like that. In fact, they show an example A raster versus a vector base uh, graphic. This apparent. This is some painting that someone famous probably did, right? Um, I don't know who. Does it say? I don't know. But this is what the painting actually looks like. Notice the green of the face is not a consistent color. All right. Likewise, the background has different shades of, of red in there, and so on. If you convert that to a vector, you get kind of an approximation of it, but you don't get the shading and all that. So you lose like the detail. But if you're doing something like a logo, like this, yeah, maybe a vector image would be good because you can expand it, make it bigger, and not lose any detail. Again, right tool for the right job. All right. Definitely for this thing, a vector is better because we can resize it and um, we don't lose any of the details or get jagged. Are there um, libraries out there for vector images like you, like other images where you can? Probably. Probably. Um, that's a good question. I actually had a student... Um, no, he's not in this class. How did... Was he in the iPhone class last semester? Or was he in the Android one? But I had a student last semester that did all his own vector drawings for these, for, for, for like if we had an assignment. And he did a good job with it, all right? Uh, I don't expect you to know how to do this. This is just more of an FYI for your information kind of thing. So that's one thing that we have, a different type of graphic. Layout. We actually have three layout files. Our activity main, which could 
consist of coordinator layout with an app bar, a toolbar, and it brings in a layout called content main. This is a way to sort of modularize your layout files. In other words, rather than having one giant layout file, all right, you can have an include file and bring in a layout file into this layout file. So in other words, where it says include layout, layout content main, it's as though when you run this, Android copies this and pastes it where it says include just brings it in. And if you've done PHP, it's just like a PHP include file. All right? A lot of languages have this. And there's, there's advantages to doing it that way. Um, we could, for example, have a different layout, and I think we see an example of this later on, whereas in portrait mode, we have layouts, we have two different activities with two different screens, where in, in landscape mode, we have two windows side by side. So if you break things down into pieces, you can put those pieces together in different ways. That's sort of like a, a primary rule of any sort of programming. So if we break this out into its own piece, we might have the ability that we could do some cool stuff with it. All right? In this case, we have a recycler view, and that's going to be used for the scrolling items. Finally, we have a list item, and that is going to be effectively what each of these list items looks like. Like all it says for a list item is we have a single text view. Well, that's what contains the tag, the CV. So we have more layouts than usual. Each of these are kind of pieced together using other layouts. One thing that's definitely different about this is that we don't know how many rows are in here in advance, right? In this case, there's two rows, but there could be no rows or one row or ten rows, okay? So each of those rows, the number of rows is going to vary. That's sort of different than what we've had on any UI before. All the UIs that we had before, we might have had text views and edit text views and buttons and so on, but the number of views stayed the same from when we started it to when we're done. Here we're actually going to be adding views as we add more items to them. Okay. Menu. Nothing in there. We have our... Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Where do those views get stored? I mean, do they become part of the application and then whoever runs it, they have their own storage for that app for running? What that do you mean, where, does, where do they get like stored? Like Twitter searches, for example. If I load it or you load it, obviously there's a different set of queries that we oh, have. Oh, so where does the data get stored? Right. Okay. Because the views are defined in the XML file. Okay. The specific data, we're going to see where those get stored. You have several alternatives about storing data in an Android application. You can actually store it in a database. All right. In this case, this uses what are called shared preferences. Shared preferences is a quick and dirty way to sort of save stuff data for an application, all right? And your, the short preferences on your device would be different than the ones on mine, so you'd have your Twitter searches on that mine. Here's our icons, which if you remember, we have 
based on different screen densities. And we reviewed why that is last time when we talked about DPs and so on. Values, we have some arrays. All right. String arrays for the menu, share, edit, delete. Colors, dimensions. We have dimensions for a normal size screen and for bigger than 820 DP. And we have our strings, just like before. So most of our time is going to be looking at the Java code and how the Java code uses these three layout files to piece together and create the application. Now, as we go through this, we might um, we might go over a part, see some part in the code, and I might say, we're not going to talk about that right now. <laughs> All right? I want to cover, how do I want to say it? I want to cover different aspects of the app, but I don't want to get hung up talking about every line of code, all right, from the beginning to the end. So therefore, we might talk about, for example, when you first load the app, what happens, all right? And then we might talk about when you add, we might cover like use cases. When we add an item, this is what happens, this is the flow of events. When we edit, when we delete, when we click on it to view the Twitter search. So we're kind of going to view that in, uh, you know, as use cases, where we pick a scenario and we trace it all the way through, which might require us to skip parts of the code that are there. For example, I'm even going to take it further, and the first time through we're going to talk about how this works the very first time you load this application because I don't want to get into the storage of stuff quite yet. So we'll talk about when you first load this up and you, you don't have any, anything saved yet, what's the flow and how it works. And then adding the first one and, and so on. Okay, we have three different objects in this. We have our main activity, that's the boss. Right? That's the one that represents this activity. Remember, what is an activity? An activity is we're presenting the user with a screen where they can do something on. This activity makes use of a couple other classes. The item divider is kind of funny. All it really is, is an instruction to draw this line in between things. Seems like overkill, right? That we require a class just to put a line like that. But, c'est la vie. The other class that we have is the searches adapter. And the searches adapter is what handles the bottom part of the screen. Okay, it supplies the data for the bottom part of the screen, it draws the bottom part of the screen, and it handles what happens when we click on or long press, long click on an item in the list. All right. So, very first scenario, the first time I bring up this app. Let's look at the main activity. Main activity extends app compatible. We have all our imports up here. We declare a static final string named searches that has a value of searches. What's another name for a private static final variable? Searches is a constant that just is the word searches. Why do we define it as a constant? 
sort of like the same reason that we put it in the strings file, right? So we can call it by one name, and we don't have to remember what that name is everywhere in the app. We don't, and if we want to change it, we can change it in one place, and everywhere in the app is taken care of. All right, we have our edit text fields. That relates to the query text and the tag. So this is the, this is going to hold a pointer to the query edit text. This is going to hold a pointer to the tag edit text. Floating action button, it's this guy here. Shared preferences is going to be the mechanism by which we are saving this. All right. Probably won't talk about that today. The list, the, the tag searches are actually a list of strings. We are storing for each string, I'm sorry, for each search, we're storing the tag name, the name that we have given to that search. And so behind the scenes, we have a list of each of the tags. This is like an array list. We have a search adapter that handles this part of the screen. That's what that object is. And here we see the definition for it. So that's what handles that lower part of the screen. So, we start the application. Super on create saved instance. Yep, we have done that on every single one. We'll do it every other one that we do. Set content view, our layout activity main. All right, so that will take this and make that the main layout of the page. We create a toolbar, or we, I'm sorry, we grab a pointer to the tool, toolbar by finding the thing that has an ID, our ID toolbar. And that's right here, I think. Yeah, there we go. Our ID toolbar. So toolbar has that. And we say set support action bar toolbar. So that makes it the toolbar for this activity. We grab our edit text pointer to the query edit text. We grab the pointer to the tag edit text. And then we add a text listener to each of them. Now notice in this case, the text listener to, to each of them is named text watcher. We have one listener for both of the text fields. What do you think, what kind of code are we going to find in this text listener? What happens when we enter characters in this? So I enter something in here. I enter something in here. What is that listener listening for? What code do you think lives in that listener? If you could describe it in words. You don't have to describe the text just things. Change the text change listener. Both of these have the same text change listener. All right, right? I can see that because add text change listener, text watcher, text watcher. I'm using the same class to handle a handle what happens when the value of this text changes. So that function is listening for the value of this text edit text field changing and this edit text field changing. What happens when, what happens? What, what do you think that text listener is doing? Yes? Exactly. The job of this text listener is to enable, or I shouldn't say enable, make visible or make invisible the floating save button. 
right? Because if there, if either of the fields is blank, then we don't show the save button. If both of the fields have something in them, we say we show the save button. So if we were to look at that text listener, remember both these have the same text listener. What happens is, is that text watcher, all right, is looking to see if there's something in each of the fields. If there is, it's going to make the save button visible. If not, it's going to make it invisible. So let's look at that. Here's our text watcher. Private final text watcher named text watcher is a new text watcher. It's that inner anonymous class, all right? What methods do we need? Because this is a text watcher, it needs a before text change method, an on text change method, and an after text change method. All right? So we have, so it has all three of those methods. The only one it has a code for is the on text change listener. And that says update save FAB, floating action button. Okay? This is following our policy that a listener doesn't have a lot of code in it. Right? Remember, we talked about that before. Listener's job is to listen for something happening and then probably it's going to call another function to actually do the work. All right? So, if either of these text fields change, it's going to call update save FAB. Because this is an inner class, it has access to all the properties and methods inside the parent class. So let's find update save FAB. Here we go. And what does this do? It looks to see if one or the other right. Took me a second. It checks to see if one or the other is empty. That's what the two pipes mean. It means or. So if the query is empty or the tag is empty then you can't save. Hide the button. If, however, both of them are not empty, if neither of them, no, if, if both of them have something in them, I don't want to talk in too many negatives, then we show the save floating button. What's the save floating button? Well, we have here, we grab a pointer to it. Save action floating button is a floating action button that we find on our layout called FAB. Okay? So, that's what makes, so we've learned one thing already. We've made the button visible, we've seen the code that makes the button visible and invisible. Boom, I change it again, it disappears because now one of the fields is empty. Okay. Now, let's look at that floating action button. That floating action button we've defined as save floating action button. We grab a pointer to it by looking at the thing on the layout that has an ID of r.id.fab. We then set the on click listener of it, of it to this. We set the on click listener to save button listener. Set the oh, save button listener.
listener has the code that's going to handle what happens when we click that button. All right? What kind of object is save button listener? We've seen these before. An on click listener. And I love the little, that, that's, that's like a little buzzer like on Jeopardy, you got it right. I should actually do that. I should have like a control here. And if I get wrong, <laughs> you know. If it's an on click listener, what function must it have? An on click. An on click. So let's look and see if we're right. Public final on click listener. So it's an on click listener. And lo and behold, this is the on click method. All right. What does this do? What does the on click method do? I think we know intuitively what it does. It saves the tag search. But let's look at how it saves the, the tag search. It grabs a query. It grabs a tag. If both of these have something in it, all right, so if this one's not empty and this one's not empty, it's going to hide the virtual keyboard. It's going to save the tag and the query. It's going to empty out the edit text field for the query. And it's going to empty out the edit text field for the tag edit. So if I go in here and type in Cleveland Cavaliers. type CC, all right? The text listener made that visible, but when both things had something in it. I click Save. It's going to hide the keyboard. I'm cheating and using my computer keyboard instead of the, the virtual keyboard that pops up on the screen. All right, there's a virtual keyboard. If I click it, the Save, it hides a virtual keyboard, all right? I showed it so I could hide it again. It's going to save that, which we'll look at the mechanics of how it does that later, but it saved it, and it blanked out the two text fields. And it put the focus back in the query field, so the cursor's in there blinking, so we can add our next search. Okay, this is about as far as we're going to get today. Next time we'll pick up talking about what happens when we do an add tag search. How do we actually save this? What's the mechanism we use to save this? We'll also then talk about this bottom, which we've sort of avoided so far. All right, so we'll talk about this. And we'll talk about what happens when you long press, what happens when you short press, what happens when you do a Google, uh, when you say you want to do a Twitter search, why does it bring up those two applications, and so on. All right, that's where we'll pick up next time. Any questions right now?